Um, welcome to the meetings with the Psalms and Psalters, uh, the second series. My name is Monika Opalinska and I will be the host of today's meeting. Professor Magdalena harzinska wujcik is the co-host um, and also a co-organizer of the series. Magda is an affiliated scholar uh, with the Nanovic Institute at the University of Notre Dame and the John Paul II Catholic University in Lublin in Poland. Um, I represent the Institute of English Studies at the University of Warsaw in Poland and a, a research group for the study of manuscripts, SIGLU. Um, just a brief reminder, um, at the end of our meeting, I will show you a slide with the list of our previous meetings. But to remind you briefly, um, you may find the recordings of all the previous sessions on the Nanovic Institute website. And these include the 2023 sessions, as well as the two talks from January and February by Jane Toswell and Alderic Blom. Um, and as always, our thanks go to the Nanovic team for the unfailing support. It gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker, Professor Elizabeth Solopova from the University of Oxford. Uh, Elizabeth received her PhD at the University of Oxford in 1994, and from 1995, she worked as a research officer on the Canterbury Tales project at the University of Sheffield and on the revision of the Index of Middle English Verse uh, at the University of Oxford. From 2000 to 2009, she was employed as a researcher at the Department of Special Collections and Western Manuscripts at the Bodleian Library. She's currently employed as a research fellow at the English faculty at the University of Oxford and as a lecturer in medieval English literature at the Harris Manchester College in Oxford. Elizabeth also acts as a member program committee for the Center of the Study of the Bible in the Humanities. She's an editor of the Oxford University Press monograph series, The Bible and the Humanities, and a member of the editorial team, editorial board for the Index of Middle English Prose. Her research focus is on the Wycliffe Bible, its origin, its history interpretation, on the manuscripts of the Wycliffe Bible, on Latin Bibles and vernacular translations on biblical register. All of the above and many other aspects of the Wycliffe Bible have been the subject of numerous papers and chapters in co-edited volumes in monographs. Some of her more recent publications include the Wycliffe Bible Origin, History and Interpretation, published in 2017, uh, also a co-edited volume from the Vulgate to the Vernacular for debates on an English question circa 1400, published in 2020 in Toronto. And I should also mention a recently published paper, Multiplying Words, the Wycliffe Bible and the Development of the Biblical Register, a chapter included in translation automatisms in the vernacular texts of the Middle Ages and early modern period, published in 2023. Elizabeth also coordinates and or participates in several online projects, including Wycliffe Bible, the digital edition, the Go Map of Great Britain, which is an edition and facsimile of the oldest surviving map to represent Great Britain in a geographically recognizable form, and the Index of Middle English Verse, which I already mentioned before. Let me also add that outside the academic world, I think Elizabeth is um, very well known as the co-author of the key concept uh, in medieval literature and also the keys of Middle Earth discovering medieval literature through the fiction of J.R.R. Tolkien, a book that was published in 2005, and then a second considerably expanded edition uh, appeared in 2015. Several years ago, um, I think in 2017, Elizabeth published a chapter on the Wycliffe Psalms uh, in a volume um, by Francis Lenagan and Tamara Atkins that we all know so well. And today, she has kindly agreed to talk about translation strategies in the Wycliffe Psalms. Elizabeth, thank you for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. It is a great pleasure to speak as part of this series. 
And so my focus today will be the translation strategies with the weekly fight Psalms. But I would like to start with a brief introduction of the weekly fight Bible to make the talk more intelligible to those who work in different traditions, who don't work in medieval uh, English tradition. So I will start with a brief introduction to the weekly fight Bible. I apologize to the experts who already who are already familiar with this material. So the Weekly Fight Bible is the first complete translation of the Vulgate in English, produced at the end of the 14th century, probably in Oxford by the followers of John Wycliffe. Though accurate and entirely uncontroversial, it encountered hostility of the English church and was condemned and banned within 25 years of its, experience, of its uh, appearance. In spite of the ban, it survives in a very large number of manuscripts. Over 250 copies are known to exist today, which is considerably more than any other medieval English work. The manuscripts, as you can see here, tend to be professionally produced. They do not look like underground productions in spite of um, the censorship and ban. Quite a few luxury copies are preserved, such as this one or this one, both made for the nobility and decorated by mainstream artists, almost certainly in London. The translation survives in two versions, known to modern scholars as the earlier version and the later version. The earlier version was probably made in the late 1470s and early 1480s and closely follows the Latin text. The later version is a more, um, is, is a more idiomatic revision of this earlier translation, <clears throat> probably produced in the late 1480s. We don't know who the translators were but there is little doubt that they were academically trained and had access to a considerable supply of books. The Wycliffe Bible is a very learned translation. Today, I will focus on just one aspect of the translator's work, their approach to rendering the, the biblical text, particularly the text of Psalms. I will draw your attention to the science behind the enterprise, there is evidence that the translators undertook considerable research into the language of the Bible and used scholarly tools to understand it and to represent it adequately in English. But I would also like to emphasize the creativity and linguistic innovation evidence in the Wycliffeite Bible. Translation is, of course, a literary as well as a scholarly activity. The Wycliffe Bible is, of course, not the only surviving Middle English translation of the Psalms. As you know, three more Middle English translations exist. The Book of Psalms was translated into English in the Middle Ages more frequently than any other biblical book. This undoubtedly reflects its exceptionally important role in Christian liturgy, spirituality, as well as in art and education. Though the importance of Psalms in medieval culture is very well understood, it is perhaps more difficult to explain their prominence within the context of the Wycliffe movement. But their importance in this context as well is evident already in how they survive, in their survival. The majority of the manuscripts of the Wycliffe Bible, what we count among the over 250 copies, do not contain the complete biblical text. Most are part Bibles and contain only a selection of biblical books. And so the frequency of copying of individual books is important. As pointed out by Anne Hudson in Premature Reformation, the selection of books in Wycliffe part Bibles generally reflects the lowered perception of relative importance of various parts of the scripture. As one would expect, the Gospels have preeminence, whereas the only marginal surprise, as Anne Hudson puts it, is the Psalter, 
It is one of very few biblical books that was copied separately. Several weekly fight psalters containing only the book of the book of Psalms survive. Psalms are also given superior attention in commentaries. Examples of this are the weekly fight revision of Richard Roller's English Psalter commentary and extensive glosses to Psalms that survive in a single manuscript, Bodley 554, that was recently edited for the Early English Text Society by Mike Kuczynski. According to Hudson, the weekly fights had no sympathy with the monastic recitation of the Psalms in regular services. They seem like the later 16th and 17th century Puritans to have been unable to escape from the traditional high regard for this book of the Old Testament. <clears throat> this slide shows a page from Bodley 554 that I have just mentioned, a copy with an extensive gloss. Wickliffite Psalters are typically small volumes starting, uh, sorry, sharing many features with Latin liturgical psalters. In addition to Psalms, the Wiglified Psalters, like Latin liturgical psalters, usually contain biblical and non-biblical canticles and sometimes the Athanasian Creed. The Psalms are presented with traditional liturgical divisions and Latin incipits, as you can see here in the margins, in the margin, no, opposite, opposite the, the beginning of Psalm 26. The Psalms, the Wikified Psalters use punctuation, traditional for Latin liturgical Psalters, and contain some titles, a translation of Latin titles found in liturgical Psalters. Again, you can see the translated title here in red at the start of Psalm 26. But moving on to the issues of translation, one of the most important differences between the Wycliffeite Bible and earlier English translations is research undertaken by the translators into the underlying Latin text. The translators were aware that the text found in their contemporary Latin Bibles was highly variable and frequently corrupt. The use of a potentially corrupt Latin original was unsurprisingly one of the principal arguments against biblical translation. To address this, the Wikify translators attempted to establish an authoritative Latin source text for their work. The Wikify Bible survives with an introductory text known by the modern title as the General Prologue. Much of it is a summary of the Old Testament, but it also contains a discussion of biblical translation and interpretation and an account of the translator's work. According to the general prologue, the translators gathered many old Bibles and consulted authorities and commentaries in order to make one Latin Bible as much as possible era three, sorry, era free. Uh, this is the first point made by the author. As you can see, first, the simple creature had much labor with diverse fellows and helpers to gather many old Bibles and, uh, and, and other doctors and a common gloss, meaning the Glossa Ordinaria, to make one Latin Bible somewhat true. The author of the general prologue confidently claims that the later version of the Wycliffeite Bible has less need to be corrected than the text of commonly available Latin Bibles. So the common Latin Bibles have more need to be corrected, as many as I have seen in my life, than has the English Bible lately translated. Modern research has shown that this is not just an empty claim to scholarship. Moreover, the work on the Latin text seems to have continued throughout the project, expanding to revision that produced the later version. 
as demonstrated by Henry Hargreaves, there are, uh, there are a number of readings where the earlier version is based on an inferior Latin text, whereas the later version has the one found in modern editions of the Vulgate. This slide shows the text of the two versions at Psalm 23. And by the way, I will be using the Vulgate numbering of the Psalms throughout this paper. I have included the Vulgate text as it appears in Weber Gryson edition. As you can see, the later version translates the first part of this verse, the generation of men seeking him. The text of the earlier version, however, is based on a rare variance, the substitution of Deum, God, for Elm, him. As a result, it translates this verse as the generation of men seeking God. This reading is considered inferior by the modern textual critics of the Vulgate. The Latin readings chosen by the translators were not always those considered to be correct by modern scholars. But there is little doubt that the Wikified translation of Psalms and its revision are attempts to bring the English text in line with the Latin version considered to be correct. As demonstrated by Henry Hargreaves, the major source of corrections in the later version that help the translators to decide between different readings in Latin manuscripts was the commentary on Psalms by Nicholas Lyra. A significant number of corrections to the Latin text can be explained with reference to his work. The remaining ones do not derive from any single source and are probably indeed a result of comparing manuscripts of the Latin text of consulting commentaries on Psalms, including Augustine, Cassiodorus, and Glossa Ordinaria, as well as consulting the Correctoria, or lists of variants and emendations to the Paris text of the Vulgate that were circulated from the early 13th century. <coughs> Perhaps the most significant area of difference between the early and the later versions of the translation is the style of translation. Though both versions stay very close to the original, literal renderings are particularly characteristic of the earlier version. As a result, the earlier version has been seen in the past as the translator's first draft that was never intended for circulation and escaped the translators by accident. A more convincing explanation from my point of view is that this difference is deliberate and that the two versions are based on different translation strategies and different stylistic consideration, considerations. Literalness was certainly an approach advocated by medieval theory of biblical translation, where word-for-word -word translation was considered to be a safeguard against any alteration of the original thought. So rather than showing ineptitude in English idiom, the literalness of the earlier version may have been part of a plan to meet the most rigid specifications for the English Bible. There is evidence that the earlier version was intended as a text for scholarly purposes. For example, it is used as the biblical text in the Glossed Gospels, the Wikified Commentary on the Gospels. This must have been a deliberate choice because the, compil the compilers of the Glossed Gospels must have had access to both versions. This is evidence in, evidence in their use of the text revised in the direction of the later version for parts of the Gospels and for Lemata in the commentary. The earlier version is also the text used in luxury complete Bibles made for noble patrons, such as the Edgerton Bible in the British Library that I have shown previously. It is decorated with the arms of Thomas of Woodstock, Duke of Gloucester, the youngest son of King Edward III. <clears throat> 
This is another example of a luxury manuscript of the earlier version. This Bible currently in Wolfenbüttel in Germany was owned by Thomas of Lancaster, brother of Henry V. These two copies are dated on art historical grounds to the final decade of the 14th century, when the later version was available and already in circulation, so possibly also a deliberate choice. So the earlier version seems to have been treated by contemporaries as a text worthy of careful copying and dissemination presumably a text with an appeal to a specially trained audience, such as clergy. The later version that survives in a much larger number of copies was probably a text produced with a wider audience in mind, including laity and less educated clergy. The translators seem to have experimented with different strategies to achieve clarity and at the same time to stay faithful to the source. The final chapter of the general prologue insists that the translation was intended to render the meaning as clear or clearer in English as in Latin and not go far from the letter, so to stay close to, to the source, but to be open or clear or opener in English um, um, than in Latin. <coughs> The author of the prologue acknowledges that the differences between English and Latin require deviation from the word-for-word -word correspondence between the translation and the original. He advocates sense-for-sense -sense approach to translation and gives detailed recommendations as to how Latin constructions, which do not have exact equivalents in English, can be rendered idiomatically. These include include absolute participle constructions, relative clauses, and common adverbs that change their meaning depending on the context. The author also advocates the use of the natural English word order, where word-for-word -word translation doesn't make sense. Such recommendations were certainly implemented in the later version, but at the same time, the text of both versions is collated against the Vulgate, and all deviations from the Latin text are declared to the reader. <clears throat> the English text doesn't, that doesn't correspond to anything in the Latin original is underlined in red or black in carefully produced manuscripts, a practice that almost certainly goes back to the translators. This slide shows the opening verse of Psalm 26 in Latin, followed again by the two Wycliffeite versions. As you can see, a more literal earlier version closely follows Latin and doesn't include the verb to be in the opening words of the Psalms, or the Psalm translating Dominus Illuminatio Mea as the Lord is my lighting. And, and by the way, lighting and lightning were morphological variants in Middle English, both meaning illumination. The later version includes the verb to be, the Lord is my lighting, lightning. The verb to be is underlined, Um, is underlined in carefully produced manuscripts of the Bible, since it doesn't correspond to anything in the Latin text. You can see it here. This is the beginning of Psalm 26. And as you can see, the verb to be is, is underlined. The later version tends to use a more natural English syn syntax and word order. This is the second verse of Psalm 26, and as you can see, it has a question at the end. And in the earlier version, the question doesn't have an inversion of the subject and the verb required by English grammar in questions. It reads, for whom I shall quake. But the inversion is introduced in the later version, for whom shall it tremble?
At the same time, the later version uses tremble as a transitive verb, to tremble someone, meaning to be afraid of someone. This is certainly an innovation. Such usage is not attested anywhere else in Middle English. The Middle English Dictionary has a long entry for trample. It was a very common word, and it illustrates the different meanings with a large number of examples. But it doesn't list a single example of the transitive use outside the Wycliffe Bible. The Oxford English Dictionary has an entry for tremble and gives some examples of transitive use, but it marks it as rare and, and shows that it is attested only for a relatively short period of time from the late 14th century to the first half of the 16th century. And again, as you can see, the only Middle English example, the first example here, is from the Wycliffe Bible. The two other examples are from the 16th century. And interestingly, both are from religious texts. So could this be the influence of the Wycliffe Bible? Very possibly. There is plenty of evidence that it influenced the development of the English language, and we are only now starting to understand the full extent of such influence. <laughs> we characterize the later version as less literal and more interpretative translation, not only for linguistic reasons, but also because of alterations that it introduces. Such alterations reflect a desire to control the understanding of the text. They are not particularly common, but they do exist. In this example, at Psalm 40, 44, the, as you can see, the earlier version stays close to Latin, but the later version adds an address to Christ in line with a Christological interpretation of this psalm. Christ, thou, thou art fairer in shape than the sons of men. There is one other topic that I wanted to discuss in connection with literalness, interpretation, and innovation. And this is the translator's interest in etymology and philologically inspired translations. The Wycliffe translators were undoubtedly familiar with Magni Derivationis or Hugicio of Pisa, a widely used and comprehensive Latin etymological dictionary. Hugicio's lexicon had a pan-European circulation and was known to both scholars and poets. Famously, it was used by Dante, who cites it in his Convivio. Derivationis is also the source of Dante's Greek vocabulary, his etymologies of Latin words, and of some of his imagery in the Divine Comedy. The derivations was well known in England and Oxford. Oxford libraries alone preserve several 13th and 14th century copies, some either made in England or with English and Oxford connections. This manuscript, for example, has a 15th century Oxford binding. Such copies of Hugicio tend to be small practical books with numerous notes in medieval hands. Hugicio's lexicon was almost certainly one of the tools used by the translators of the Wycliffe Bible. In several cases where the renderings of the two versions differ, the reading of the later version shows the influence of Hugicio's definitions. Thus, exasperare is translated as terran in the earlier version and muck and sharp in the later version. Terran means to provoke anger and vex in Middle English. Hugicio, however, glosses exasperare as facere asperum, make sharp. Hugicio's lexicon 
may have also inspired the Wikify translator's interest in etymology and what can be described as philological literalism that is characteristic of both versions. <clears throat> the Bible shares this feature with the Lollard revision of Richard Roller's English Psalter commentary. The meaning of in in Latin differs according to the case it governs. The accusative is used where motion in is implied with a sense into, whereas the dative and ablative are used when the meaning is locative, in or on. Anne Hudson pointed out that the original Richard Rollis translation of Psalms had in in all such cases, thus losing the distinction between into the land and in the land. In the Lollard revision of Rolle, however, one of the most widespread changes was the introduction of this distinction. Into was used where the Latin noun had the accusative case, whereas in was used where the source had the dative or ablative. Lollard revision of Rolle was generally in the direction of greater fluency. And so such philological literalism is a major exception that goes against this wider tendency. This raises question, questions about the authorship of the revision and the Wikified Bible and the possibility of the shared authorship of both works. There are plenty of examples of philological literalism in the Wikify translation of Psalms in both versions, and I will give only one example. For instance, the translators make a careful distinction between Latin vocare, invocare, and revocare. Invocare and re revocare are translated consistently with different adverbs, as you can see on this slide. And to continue with the theme of the translator's work on vocabulary of the English Bible, I would now like to discuss briefly the changes that were made as part of the revision from the earlier version to the later version that a careful consideration was given to the rendering of Latin terms throughout the process of translation and revision is evident again in the comments made by the author of the general prologue in the passage about the four stages of his and his helper's work. As you can see, the third stage, uh, indicated with the number three here on this slide, is described as consulting the works of old grammarians and theologians in order to understand and translate better difficult words. <clears throat> as, as it says here in the prologue, the third time to, to consult um, or the third stage was to consult with old grammarians and old theologians about hard words and hard meanings, how they might be best understood and translated. The comparison of the two versions <laughs> showed that revision involved, involved a reconsideration of the rendering of a very large number of Latin terms. The text of the Wikified Psalms contains dozens of words that the earlier and later versions regularly translate differently. A small selection of such words and their Latin equivalents is shown on this slide. So it is, as you can see, there is quite a variety of words here, and this is only a very small selection. There are theological and devotional terms such as Gentiles or prayer, and then there are words of ordinary vocabulary such as um, earth, dust, and so on, both nouns and verbs. The correspondences of this type and their regularity can be illustrated by the opening words of Psalm 35 that reads, The unrighteous said that he sinned. As you can see, the earlier version uses the words, the words unrichtweise and guilter 
whereas the later version has un unjust and trespassing. In another Psalm 36, Richtweise appears nine times in the later, in the earlier version and is changed in every single case to just in the later version. Similarly, Urathe appears ten times in Psalm 77 in the earlier version and is changed to Ira with the same perfect regularity. The differences in vocabulary between the two versions are consistent throughout the entire translation of Psalms. This shows a considerable level of planning and organization behind the translation and its revision, though no, no direct evidence for this survives, and we don't know where or by whom the work was done or how it was organized. But to achieve regularity, similar to modern search and replace, the translators must have had a list of words they agreed to render differently. They may also have used scholarly finding aids, such as the concordances to the Latin Bible. Concordances were common in the 14th century and were routinely used by preachers. There is even a concordance based on the Wycliffe Bible surviving in a single manuscript now in the British Library. It is a modest working copy dated to the first half of the 15th century. It lists the words in an alphabetical order, each followed by references to the books and chapters of the Bible. The concordance is preceded by a substantial introduction discussing linguistic difficulties the compiler had to resolve, such as the existence of synonyms and homonyms, inflected forms and derivatives, and of dialect and orthographic variation. The compiler also explains that the con concordance is fully alphabetized, not just by the first letter, but by all letters of English words. This is an unusually sophisticated practice at a time when alphabetization by initial letters only was a much more common practice. Similarly to Latin concordances, this is almost certainly designed as an aid to preaching. But the translators may have used similar tools to identify and record occurrences of words that they decided to translate differently in the later version. But what was the purpose of the revision of vocabulary? A large number of words whose renderings were changed are theological and devotional terms, such as commandment, prayer, trespass, just, sign, impious, praise, and similar. Thus, for example, Gentiles, widely used in the earlier version, is avoided in the later version and replaced by heathen men or folk. The earlier version normally translates sancti as saints, but this is usually replaced by holy men in the later version. The choice of words and regularity of, division, of revision suggest that the translator's concerns were broader than simply producing a readable English text and extended to the development of standard terminology for theological and devotional discourse. Perhaps the most interesting example of a reassessment of the rendering of a theological term in the text of Psalms is the translation of anima, usually rendered as soul in the earlier version, but replaced with life in the later version. Such use of life in the biblical text may have been an innovation of the later version, it is uncharacteristic of earlier English translations of Psalms, where anima is regularly translated as soul. The translator's work on vocabulary was indebted to earlier and contemporary interest in the richness, multiplicity, and ambiguity of the biblical language. <laughs> 
Such interest is evident in detailed studies of polysemy of biblical terms and descriptions of their multiple meanings that were widely used in exegesis, exegesis and preaching. This interest is evident in collections of distinctions that became popular in the second half of the 12th century. There are essentially dictionaries that describe the meaning of biblical terms. They list various meanings of words, distinguishes, distinguishing up to 10 or 15 different significations, and illustrate them with examples from the Bible. One of the earliest known collections of distinctions is Peter the Chanter's widely circulated Summa Abel. It is an alphabetically arranged glossary designed to guide the interpretation of the ambiguous words in the Bible. It includes the word anima that is given six sets of meanings, each subdivided into several senses illustrated by their occurrences in the Bible. It records the sense life, vita presence, as one of the meanings of anima. The meaning life is illustrated in Summa Abel by a quotation from St. John's Gospel, he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Polysemy is, of course, a preoccupation of both scholars and poets. Scholarly interest in polysemy is also evident in late medieval English literary works, including P.S. Plowman. Such interest was probably inspired by theological discussions of signification. At the beginning of Passus 15, Langland lists, with reference to Augustine and Isidore, the polysemous meanings of anima, differentiated by function or actions performed by the soul, including life, as you can see in this quotation. But in addition to theological vocabulary, the two wickified versions of Psalms translate differently a very large number of ordinary words, such as the ones showing here, including dust, land, in circle, and so on. This suggests that not only scholarly and theological, but also stylistic concerns played a role in the translation and its revision. The later version, for example, tends to replace informal phrasal verbs used in the earlier version with their Latinized synonyms shown at the bottom of this slide. So, don away in the earlier version corresponds to departing in the later version. The later version, however, is not always more, more Latinized than the earlier version. On the contrary, it generally prefers more familiar, accessible, and less experimental vocabulary, thus reducing linguistic creativity evident in the earlier version. Occasionally, the earlier version renders a Latin word with an English word of the same root. Sometimes this is the first attested usage of the English word. Sometimes it, it seems to be an innovation, a, uh, a, a, a borrowing, a new borrowing introduced by the translators. Um, whereas, um, whereas the later version tends to avoid this and as a result often replaces the Latin term with its familiar, with, with its vernacular synonym. But the Latin version translators, but, but sorry, but the later version translators were not at all averse to the use of words of foreign origin. Um, avoiding such words was not the aim. They are happy to use them as long as they're well established in English. So, for example, envirunen, meaning to surround is not attested before the Wycliffe Bible, 
It was probably an innovation introduced by the translators of the earlier version, whereas compassion used in the later version was common in English since the beginning of the 14th century. Again, dividend is not attested before the end of the 14th century, according to the Middle English Dictionary, whereas departen was in use from the 14th century. Hund. The earlier version prefers hund, whereas the later version prefers dog. So hund, of course, means simply a dog, any dog in Old English. And this is what it still means in Chosa. But we know that its meaning eventually narrowed, <clears throat> becoming more than hound. So perhaps this was happening already, at least in some dialects at the end of the 14th century. And perhaps this is why the word was avoided by the later version. A similar narrowing of meaning happened in flood. And this, again, may be the reason for the later version preference. Both granny and snare were common in the 14th century, but granny eventually disappeared, as we know, disappeared from English, whereas snare survives into modern English. So perhaps the use of granny was already declining in the late 14th century. So these correspondences are not always um, easy to, to explain, but the general tendency seems to be that the later version prefers more familiar, less experimental vocabulary, replace, replaces less familiar terms with more familiar words. Translators' deliberation between different possible ways of rendering the same word is also evident in the so-called alternative translations and intertextual glosses, variant translations and explanations of Latin words that appear within the biblical text, text or sometimes in the margins of the manuscripts of the Wycliffe Bible. The second equivalent or a short gloss is typically introduced by or, either, or that is, and is underlined in red or black in manuscripts. This is a page from a manuscript of the Bible with alternative translations underlined. As you can see, there are quite a few of them, and they are kept linguistically and visually separate from the biblical text. So they are they do not correspond to anything in their uh, source text, and therefore they are underlined. In the past, alternative translations were commonly interpreted as relics from the initial stages of the translator's work, reflecting uncertainty about the appropriate rendering of words and phrases. Most critics believed that the translators intended to eliminate these alternatives and choose one of the variants in the final version. The problem with this interpretation, however, is that alternative translations are found in both reductions, in both the earlier version and in its revision. They can be seen prominently underlined in carefully produced copies, including luxury illuminated manuscripts. And this suggests that the bookmakers didn't see them as evidence of an unfinished or defective state of the text. They are treated as part of the scholarly apparatus that legitimately ac accompanies the translation and need to be presented carefully and correctly. And the bookmakers must have, at least initially, collaborated with the translators themselves, who presumably developed such conventions. Alternative translations and intertextual glosses are best understood as a semantic device designed to achieve precision, capture more fully the meaning of the original, and in some cases, to provide the text with commentary. This is again the beginning of Psalm 26, and as you can see, there is a gloss this time in the margins, in the margin that reads, that is hostess, that is hosts, 
And, and this is linked to the word castles in the translation through the use of a special sign. Here is this verse, and as you can see, the earlier version uses the word tense to translate Latin castra. The authors of the later version clearly realized that tense is not a good translation because it doesn't have the same range of meaning as Latin castra. It fails to render the sense military fortifications required by this passage. And so the later version uses the word castles, a borrowing of Latin castrum into English via French, well established in English at that time. This preserves, this is a familiar word to the reader, and, and it preserves better the military overtones of the original, but it still fails to communicate the meaning fully, because Latin castrum means not only a fortification, but also an army. It has an agent meaning that is clearly important in this passage. Some modern English translate, translations have armies in camp or entrenched armies at this point. In the Wycliffite Psalter, the same range of meaning covering both fortifications and the army is achieved through the addition of a gloss that is hosts. I'm getting very close to the end of this paper, but the final topic I would like to discuss briefly is heresy. The general prologue to the Wikified Bible makes clear that the translators' theological and political views differed from those of the official church. But does this also mean that the text of the Wikified Bible was influenced by Lollard ideas? This was certainly a presumption behind Archbishop Arundel's constitutions. This legislation promulgated in 1409 aimed to regulate preaching, the teaching of theology, and the use of biblical translations. The constitutions didn't prohibit straightforwardly the making of new translations of the Bible, but insisted that such translations must be examined for heretical opinions. Opinions. So there is an expectation that there will be heretical opinions embedded in the text. An expectation that the translation of the Bible by Lollards would have a Lollard bias was shared by some early modern scholars as well, including Thomas More. He believed that Wycliffe, in his view, a notorious heretic, must have purposefully corrupted that holy text, maliciously planting herein such words as might in the reader's ears serve to the profit of such heresies that he went about to sow. Modern scholars, however, are yet to discover heretical opinions embedded in the text of the Wycliffe translation. The only part of the Bible that contains openly declared Lollard views is the general prologue. But as well known, it survives fully or in part in only nine of the over 250 surviving Bibles and part Bibles. It seems to have been avoided by the makers of manuscripts, presumably because of its controversial nature. The fact that the Wikified Bible and its manuscripts are almost entirely orthodox may have been known to Thomas More, who seems to have believed that Wycliffe had nothing to do with what we now call the Wycliffe Bible, and that it was the work of non-heretical medieval Christians. The 15th century opponents of the Wycliffe Bible probably were also aware that there is nothing in the translation itself that is theologically or ecclesiologically heterodox, let alone heretical. Archbishop Arundel and his successors never produced a list of unacceptable readings in the Wycliffe Bible at a time when this was a normal practice. Lists of such passages from Wycliffe's work that were considered heretical were made on several occasions. 
thus a list of over 250 passages from his Latin works was forwarded by Arundel to the Council of Constance. But it would be impossible to create such a list for the Wycliffeite Bible because there is no textual evidence for purposeful alteration of the text to bring it in line with Lollard views in either version of the translation. This is in spite of the fact, of the fact that liturgical texts in general and Psalms in particular were not exempt from the influence of religious controversy in the Middle Ages or the early modern period. I will give two examples of this, and the first one is a lectionary page from a Wycliffeite Bible presently in Praise North College in Oxford. As you can see, there is an erasure in the left-hand column close to the top of the page. So the left-hand column contains the names of various religious occasions of religious feasts, whereas the remaining columns list biblical readings for these feasts. What this is, is immediately clear to anyone familiar with English liturgical books, and not just because they did not do a very good job erasing it, maybe deliberately, and we can still read much of it. The erased text is, of course, the translation of Thomas Beckett. As you know, Henry VIII did not like him as a popular religious leader who dared to challenge the royal authority. So he destroyed the shrine of Thomas Beckett and ordered that his feasts be removed from liturgical books. Erasures of his feasts are very common in calendars and lectionaries of liturgical books that were owned in England during the Reformation. <clears throat> I have another example of the influence of religious debates, this time on the text of the Psalms. But before I share it, I need to give some background. As you know, the most common way of illustrating Psalms from the 14th century and up to the end of the Middle Ages was the so-called Parisian program of illumination that focused on the opening words of Psalms. The traditional iconography for Psalm 52 featured a fool because the Psalm started with the words, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. The fool was occasionally on his own, but often in conversation with King David, a cleric, as here, or Christ. The fool was variously portrayed, sometimes as a beggar or barely clothed madman, as here. Sometimes he is a courtly jester. And sometimes there is a mixture of some kind of the two approaches. When he is a madman, he is frequently shown holding a club and either holding or eating bread, because Psalm 52 mentions the evildoers who devour the people as men eat bread. But in the 14th and 15th century, but the 14th and 15th century were, the time, were a time of intense debates about the real presence at Eucharist. Unsurprisingly, the makers of manuscripts were aware that the words spoken by the fool in Psalm 52, that there is no God, can be interpreted in more than one way. This is Psalm 52 from the Liber Corralis, commissioned in the 1420s by the Bohemian Queen Elizabeth of Richessa for the female Cistercian monastery at Stare Brno in South Moravia. She founded the monastery and died there in 1350, uh, in 1335. As you can see, the image builds on earlier motives of, of on earlier motives of eating bread and the denial of God. But here, the fool is portrayed denying the real presence of Christ at Eucharist. This is the only such image that I know, and I'm grateful to Daniela Rivkova from the University of Ostrava, who pointed out this image to me. She has published a, an article, a very well-illustrated article about this book. <clears throat> 
So Psalms were not exempt from the influence of religious controversy, but the Wycliffeite Psalms managed largely, somehow, somehow managed largely to escape this. And to conclude, the Wycliffeite Bible, including the translation of Psalms, is an outcome of an academic project that could have been fully appreciated only by an audience whose concerns were equally academic and included an interest in comprehensiveness, textual authority, and precision in the rendering of the detail of the Latin text. But this remarkable attempt to produce a scholarly and accurate translation required not only academic knowledge, but also creativity. The Wycliffeite Bible influenced the literary tradition and the English language. A large number of words that we use today are attested for the first time in the Wycliffeite translations, including such common words as adoption, absent, or allegory. Henry Knighton, a canon of the Augustinian Abbey of St. Mary in Leicester, and one of the opponents of biblical translation in the 14th century, wrote disapprovingly that Master John Wycliffe translated the Gospel of Christ into the language of the English, not the language of the angels. The English language may be still very far from the language of the angels, but the work of the Wycliffe translators and the success of their project may have helped to narrow the gap, even if only very slightly. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Elizabeth. This was this was wonderful. I'm looking for the appropriate icon. Yes, I found it. All right, so before today's talk, I, I, before your talk today, I went through several reviews to prepare the rounding up of what I was awaiting, and I found expressions which I think I'm going to rely on because they are very appropriate. So the reviews of your work, call your work groundbreaking, meticulous, methodologically sound, excellent, illuminating, enriching, indispensable, there is also impressive, important, and extraordinary. And your talk, Elizabeth, today was all of these and many more. It was extremely informative and such a pleasure to listen to. Thank you so very, very much. Now, the floor is open to discussion. Anybody who wants to ask a question, uh, please signal your willingness to do so by uh, clicking on the hand icon. And I will ask you to ask the question, to, to formulate the question. If for any reason, either technical or personal, you cannot ask the question yourself, you can always, always type it in the chat and I will read it out. So once again, thank you very much. This was so enjoyable and absolutely excellent. And well, the angelic accent at the end was, well, just wonderful. The floor is open to discussion. Monika Opalinska, right. Right. If there are no other questions at this moment, let me uh, start perhaps. Um, uh, I have two questions, if I may. Um, you uh, mentioned uh, this incredible, uh, even though still largely unknown, um, program of coordinating the work on the Wycliffe Bibles. Um, and the fact that um, uh, the uh, scribes, uh, people who worked on, on the translations, um, referred and um, based the work um, on, uh, for example, the etymological dictionary by Huguccio Magna de Derivaciones. Um, and you also mentioned the concordance and the lists, uh, correcciones, etc. So the whole... Um, apparatus of tools and instruments that would have been helpful. Um, so I understand that they took measures um, so that um, to ensure homogeneity. Um, but my question pertains to this broad division or distinction between the early version and the late version. Um, can we really um, see them as homogeneous. And so 
in other words, to what extent were the translators, uh, the scribes, successful in rendering these uh, versions as really very homogeneous? Or can we can we see any discrepancies between specific tokens, specific manuscripts? That's one question. And another one is, I was really intrigued and fascinated by the discussion of the vocabulary. Um, I thought that perhaps um, uh, the uh, alterations in, in the words might be based on uh, choosing more um, accessible to the general public terminology. Um, and um, at the beginning, I, I started because I, I liked, loved the example that you gave about this uh, distinction between uh, accusative and dative um, in into and it brought to my mind that the same distinction that was uh, used in the uh, old English texts. So it's like a pan-Germanic tendency. So I thought that perhaps this might have been the um, uh, the uh, uh, the target. But evidently, you showed that it's it's uh, it's more than that. Uh, but my question really is about the variant glosses. You said that the main reason for using these variant glosses was to ensure um, better comprehension, understanding, um, precision of the text. Can we say that um, these glosses may have served, um, for example, uh, the purpose of um, uh, distinguishing between um, literal, metaphorical, anagogical historical senses of uh, uh, a given passage, or is it strictly linguistically oriented for precision, for, you know, uh, throwing, shedding more light on a specific uh, passage? Mm. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. So to answer the first question, how well are the two versions um, distinguished and um, how, how much variation is there in the manuscripts? There is more, more variation between the manuscripts of the earlier version. And, and I'm familiar with this issue mostly because of my editorial work. So there is more variation between the manuscripts of the earlier version. The manuscripts of the later version are somewhat more uniform. And we see what we see in manuscripts is that very strong tradition with a degree of um, uniformity. And uh, we see this uniformity in how the text is presented, the titles that are used, how it is presented on the page, even the use of script. It is almost always textura. Anglicana is an exception. So, so there is um, spelling that is used. So we see that strong tradition uh, associated with the Uglified Bible as a text, particularly in the, in the uh, later version that was copied commercially in the 15th century. And so conventions had, had a chance to develop. At the same time, it is a very good question. So uh, are the two versions um, uh, a scholarly fiction to, to an extent. And um, to, to some extent, this is also true. It is, uh, to, to an extent, it is a perception that is, um, that is um, uh, promoted by the only full edition of the Wycliffe Bible that prints the two texts as um, two uh, separate versions uh, that's uh, on, on, on the same page, in parallel on the same page. So that, that parallel presentation um, uh, pr promotes the idea of separateness. Wh whereas in reality, there is no, at least there's no surviving ideal perfect text of the earlier version and the surviving perfect text of the later version. What we see is fluidity and, and something like a drift. So um, all manuscripts of the earlier version that survive, that's, that we have 
are affected in different degrees by revision in the direction of the later version. We see that, that gradual implementation of the recommendations of the author of the general prologue. We see emerging revision of the vocabulary. So all manuscripts of the earlier version that I know of are affected to different extents uh, by this. And, and, and this was a disappointment, a disappointment for me when I started my work work on an edition because Fushel and Madden, the editors, collated very few manuscripts and you of much fewer copies than we know of today. And I was hoping to find an ideal um, an ideal copy of the earlier version, but if it ever existed, it doesn't survive. So what we um, what what we have are, I think the the two versions is still a useful a, a useful concept, but they are more like two points, and there's a continuum between them. So this is the uh, situation in uh, manuscripts. And, and your second question about uh, alternative translations and glosses, I think it's not just research, it's not just scholarly research, not just something that translators did in, in preparation as they were working on translators and thinking what would be the best possible translation for, for, for a particular term. Because if this is what they were, the translators would have wanted to eliminate them. They would not have come up with that new and interesting practice of actually keeping them in the text and highlighting them for the reader through underlinings. And, and this is how both versions are circulated. Both versions have these alternatives. So they are part of the scholarly uh, apparatus deliberately, deliberately present and deliberately kept. I don't believe that they're just um, part, part of initial work on the translation that the translators were going to uh, abandon in the final version. I think they are there for the reader. And, and so the aim is indeed to facilitate understanding and interpretation of the text, to highlight multiple meaning, meanings, polysemy within the words. And, and this is very much in line with generally with, with um, with contemporary views on the biblical language, because um, because st starting with Augustine, scholars emphasized scholars scholars had a positive view of complexity and and even ambiguity of the biblical language. That that complexity and ambiguity was seen as a theological tool, a gift to their readers that that would help them to critically understand the divine message and, and their own environment. So, so I think the glosses and in, in alternative translations are there for the reader. They are there to help with the interpretation, with understanding, with the reading of the biblical text. Thank you. So it's it's quite incredible how uh, this must have been coordinated. Um, yes, yes. So yes, and we know nothing about so, how the, the work was organized. Okay, thank you. I can see the next question, Professor Jane Toswell. Jane? Hi, Elizabeth. It's lovely to see you. Hi. And, Hi. and to have heard such a marvelous paper, because, I mean, just organizing all of that material into a coherent whole, it's just, it just amazes me that you do it every time. Um, so I have the obvious question, since you've left this, this slide up. Do you think Henry Knighton was aware of Bede and the bad puns of Gregory that Bede was quoting? And he got his understanding completely wrong in that section? Or do you think he was unaware? Um, you know, I Bede on know. Gregory yeah. in, in the slave yeah, market. Yeah, yeah, I, I all that thing. Yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. Um, yeah. Um, well, well, he must have been aware because Bede and, um, and, and, and hypothetical translation of the Bible, Bible by Bede was known. It is something that, that is discussed 
in most treatises about the translation of the Bible. So, so it was widely known and very much part of the debate about the English Bible. So he must have been aware. I, I don't know whether the puns are intentional or not, but presumably they are. Yeah. Um, it just strikes me that Knighton actually kind of reversed his own argument since Gregory would have said that it was the language of the angels because it was the language of the English. Or because of his, I mean, those puns are so bad, but <laughs> it just, yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah. kind of a neat thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it is, it is the reference to, um, yeah, to, to the well known passage from Gregory. I'm sure you're right yeah. about this. That's what it makes us think about. And I'm sure that that's um, what contemporaries thought of as well, because it is such a striking and, and memorable um, image. Yeah, and, and, thank and, you. and a pun. Okay, King Galis. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, so, Elizabeth, thank you so much for this talk. And it's amazing because, like, the talk that I'm kind of preparing is going to continue on what you just started about the vocabulary. And it's it just, I'm, I'm so thrilled about it. And, and there, there is, like, one um, one thing that I wanted to um, kind of, I, I know, I, I think that um, it's, it's stating the obvious, but... Uh, I'm wondering because, like, um, you you said that this was like innovative for uh, for them to, I mean, uh, for the authors of the later version to include these um, uh, these formulations, which were kind of glossary by either stating or or either or um, it, that is. And I'm also thinking about like the Middle English gloss per sorter, which also does that. And then there is like the um, French translation, which was what supposedly one of the sources of this um, text, which also does that. So maybe this was like, um, um, I don't know, rebirth of this kind of phenomenon that, um, um, that, that happened also in this other translation. But uh, I have a question about something else and it's really in line with what Monica was saying. So I'm wondering if, um, like because you said that there is this replacement of uh, certain vocabulary terms between the EV and LV, which has many um, kind of reasons, like being more familiar or perhaps um, not being like the the uh, fresh borrowing or perhaps some of the words being more obscure at the time. And I'm one uh, like because of them being more archaic, and wondering if um, uh, this phenomenon is also absorbed, uh, observed in other books of this of these translations. This might be like a very silly question, but I'm question. But I'm wondering: is it like only for the sorter, or is it like congruent, like consistent between different um, books of the Bible? This replacement, or are these kind of lists only uh, placements like limited to certain uh, parts of the Bible? Mm -hmm. And then there are like other tendencies in other parts. Um, with the first question, alternative translations are certainly not an invention of the Wycliffe translators. And the earliest example, it, it go, they go back to the very beginnings of the um, tradition of vernacular translations of the Bible. The only example, the earliest example I know is the Gothic translation of the Bible in um, one of the manuscripts. Uh, what survives is a preface to originally a copy of the Gothic translation presented side by side with um, with the Latin, I think, with the Latin translation. And, and there is a preface, and, and this discusses something like alternative translations. Uh, the preface is in Latin. It keeps, it, it calls them ad notatio, so kind of a gloss or a note. And, um, but, but and, and, and this is discussed, and, and 
the translators are advised to use this because it helps the reader to understand. So that's the earliest example of this that, that I know. But, but then alternative translations are found in old English manuscripts of the Gospels. And there again, they're relatively frequent. Lindisfarne Gospels has, has them. They're not difficult at all to find. There are plenty of them uh, there. A again, connected with, with actually abbreviated well, so Latin or to an old English word. And then Middle English authors use them as well, but though not in literary texts. So, for example, Chaucer uses them only in his translation of Boise, in his Boise, in his translation of the Constellation of Philosophy. And, and this is not a literary text. Um, so, so there were several devices that were used by the Middle English authors to achieve this, to, to, uh, to represent the meaning of the word in the source uh, fully, to represent the full range of, of meanings. And, and one was the alternative translation. Uh, another was some... Um, um, another, another one was simply the use of equivalence, equivalence and multiple terms. And, and multiple terms simply when the word, uh, when a word from the source is translated with multiple terms in an English version is very common in Chaucer, in Caxton, in other Middle English um, Literal, literary works and not only literary works, but is completely uncharacteristic of the Wycliffeite Bible, presumably because the Wycliffeite translators wanted to declare all their, all their uh, editions. And so they still use that device using multiple uh, vernacular words to represent the, the term of the original fully, but they don't use um, uh, they, they don't use multiple undeclared multiple translations, but they use that device of an alternative translation underlined in manuscripts and uh, linked with or or uh, that is or, or something like this. So they are distinguished from the biblical text, both visually and, and linguistically. But alternative translations are certainly not an invention of the Wycliffeite Bible. There is that tradition associated with biblical translation and translation more widely. And, and the second question about uh, cha changes to vocabulary. Changes to vocabulary are a bit of a mystery because it is clearly, it was clearly a very large part of the work on the later version, and yet the general prologue doesn't mention them at all. The author goes into all the detail about the translation of grammatical constructions, but um, but, but changes to vocabulary are not mentioned at all. And at the moment, I'm unable to say uh, how consistent it is how consistent the revision of vocabulary was across different books. I know for sure that it is not just confined to Psalms, that something similar and really quite similar is found in other um, parts of the biblical text, in, in biblical prose. But whether how comprehensive this was, I cannot say. And my suspicion would be that, it is, that there is variation there, that it is not 100%, um, 100 percent that, that it varies from book, book to book and not 100% identical through, through the entire biblical text, because both the uh, earlier version translation and the later version translation are the work of multiple authors. And, and this, again, has been demonstrated through the analysis of um, the language of um, uh, translations. This, this is clear from contemporary references to translators as well. So my suspicion is that it is not it differs uh, between the biblical books, but, but at the same time, it was uh, a, that that major effort that affected, at the very least, significant parts of the text. It is not just found in Psalms. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Well, I didn't mean to say that, if I may add, I didn't mean to say that this was like um, not practiced before. I mean, the glossing, uh, I just, I simply meant that middling the gloss pro salter does pretty much the same by kind of trying to set apart the additional things, not in all copies, obviously, but in some of them, it's either underlined or introduced by that is, sorry. Yeah, but thank sure. you very much. Because sure. there's no other person signifying their willingness to ask a question. I, I'd love to ask a question. I've, I've wanted to do that for so many years, not this particular question, but just I just wanted to pick your brains on something about the Psalms. Now, you said, and this is, I love this idea of uh, the two versions being just scholarly concepts, but in, in fact, they're being a continuum of, of versions. And uh, and I love the concept because part of my work on the Psalms is measuring the variation in terms of digital humanities. So I, I love that. But, and there's this lovely way of saying it. There are revisions towards the later version. And I'm very curious, what is actually meant by towards? Is it towards the principles that govern the later version? Or is it towards the actual choices? Or is it the... Um, the wording or the grammatical decisions, or is it something else that, well, just looks like the principle of the thing? So that is one question. Probably I won't have the time to ask another one, but um, I'll perhaps email you later if, if you allow me to. Yeah, I, I would say it's both. <laughs> it's both the, the application of the principles that are um, described in the general prologue, and um, it is um, it, it is also the actual decisions, the actual word choices that that we see implemented in the later version. That we also see to to various extent in the manuscripts of the earlier version. There are some really strange cases. So, for example, there is a manuscript in there. Uh, in new college that is somewhere in between the later version and the, the earlier version. So we see the grammar of the text already revised and uh, principles, uh, the, the principles that are described in the general prologue, the recommendations about the translation of, gram translation of grammatical constructions already implemented, but there are no changes in vocabulary. So, so it seems to preserve an intermediate stage within this process of revision. But, but, but on the whole, it is an, indeed a drift and, um, it, and, and it affects the grammatical constructions as well as vocabulary. So, um, so, so most manuscripts, all surviving manuscripts of the earlier version are affected by this. There is no, unfortunately, earlier version in, a, in its pure form. Thank you very much. So maybe just very a very brief second question. Is that all right? Sure, sure. Um, you mentioned this concordance, Royal Manuscript 17b1 in, in British Library, and you said that it's fully alphabetized and it's amazing in itself. But I wonder if because you have your list of what changes between the early version and later version in the in the Psalter. I wonder if you did have a look and see if these actual correspondences are there. Well, um, well, uh, no. And, and um, I have started further work on the, on the concordance because there were several versions of the concordance to the Latin Bible and, and they are reasonably well described and distinguished between themselves. So uh, my next task or one of my tasks is to understand what exactly the Wycliffe Bible concordance is based on, what, uh, what is the model, but, um, but on the whole it is a fairly comprehensive concordance to the Latin Bible. So it does doesn't include just the words, unfortunately, that were uh, revised on the way uh, from the earlier version to the later version. So it is not just a translator's tool, it is a concordance to the Latin Bible, so presumably made for a preacher, but translators could have used similar tools. But, but there is another manuscript in the British Library that is a great mystery, and if you, if you know the answer, then please tell me 
me because this is what we call a glossary to the Wycliffe Bible. And, and again, there is only a single copy of this. And, and this is not a concordance. So it is organized, not in an alphabetical order, but in the order of the biblical book books. So, so Genesis, Exodus, and, and so on and so on. And um, the the titles of the books are there, so you you know where you are in the Bible. But then it has a uh, a fragment of the Latin text that can be a single word or a word combination. It can be longer than a single word. So a fragment of the Latin text, and then the translation from the Wycliffeite Bible. And the choice is entirely unclear. So the only thing that I can say is that there are no personal names or place names. But apart from that, the choice is un uh, entirely unclear. So I was hoping, of course, that it, it corresponds to that revision of vocabulary that we see and the words that they changed. But it does not. It includes difficult words. Uh, more difficult Latin words, but it also includes most ordinary Latin words that are not difficult to translate at all. So, so the purpose of this is entirely unclear. I, I haven't done much research on it, but, but it is again on my list. But it is a mystery, so we don't know what this is and, and what it was for. And both the concordance and, and the glossary are carefully made manuscripts. It's not just somebody's draft or, or somebody's notes. It is a fairly small format and um, but, but it is written in textura, it has flourished initials, so it is made to be used. It's not just somebody's notes or somebody's draft, but to use how, what is the purpose? This is entirely unclear. If you have any ideas, please tell me. All right. So, well, I think we'll be on the lookout for your um, answer to that. Please do, please do. Yeah. And there's a question in, on the chat from Lorraine Anlo from New York. Is there any relationship between this manuscript and the onomasticon? Yeah, um, I just I meant that as as a question of the the manuscript we were just discussing now because it sounds like it's it's laid out similarly uh, to that you know by by book and and having a a combination of very very common things and more obscure entries. That, that's a very interesting suggestion. That's something that I need to investigate. Thank you very much. Okay, if there are no other questions, I think we'll ask Monica Opalinska to round up today's meeting and to invite you to our next meeting. Shall I stop sharing? Yes, please, Elizabeth. All right, yeah, I will share my screen in turn for a moment. Um, so, uh, as you can see from the slide that should be now available to everyone, I hope it is. Uh, it our is. Next, next meeting uh, will be on the 25th of April, and our speaker then will be Kinga Lis uh, from John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin in Poland. Kinga will be talking about 12th to 14th century vernacular Psalter. Uh, sorry, vernacular sorted translations into Middle English, Anglo-Norman and Middle French. And um, because uh, we didn't show the slides at the beginning of our meeting today, um, let me just um, uh, paste uh, onto chat a link to the Nanovic um, uh, website where you can find recordings of all of our previous uh, sessions, including uh, last year's sessions, um, and uh, uh, the two meetings that we had um, this year uh, in January by Jane Toswell and uh, in February by uh, Alderic Blom. And I hope that Elizabeth's uh, uh, talk will be available soon so uh, we can all enjoy it, uh, listen to it and re-listen again and again. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, attending our meeting um, today. And uh, once again, um, many, many thanks for a wonderful, very insightful um, talk uh, to Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me.
It was an honor. Thank you. Thank you.